<laughs> All right, guys. So this is a really important video. This is about how to survive a nuclear attack or a nuclear incident. No joking around here. We wanted to put this out because obviously of what's going on in the world. You can find the full nuclear survival program that we offer over at GutterFightingSecrets.com. Me and DJ worked on it. Obviously, myself, a uh, fire service veteran of seven years now, hazmat certified, seaburn certified. DJ obviously knows his shit, as you will see in this coming video. But if you want to learn more and you want to really, really get down into brass tacks about how to survive a nuclear incident, we got that for you over at GutterFightingSecrets.com. Check out our products. And we've actually got it bundled into a really special product where not only are you getting the survival manual, but you're also getting a bunch of other civil defense manuals as well. So I highly recommend it. But in the meantime, for all the rest of you freeloaders out there, guys, check out this program. We're putting it out for free because we really believe in the message of being prepared. And remember, if we are prepared, we can come back fighting. The current climate of the world, this may be the most useful and most important uh, topic we have covered outside of combatives. Please do not take any of this topic lightly, uh, as it is a very real issue uh, that needs to be prepared for. We hope all of this information, uh, alongside the additional resources uh, we provide and recommend, uh, helps you in your preparedness and survival in the event of a nuclear event. This is the Gutter Fighting Secrets Nuclear Attack Preparedness and Survival Manual presented by D. Jacobson and Will Sherland. In the event of a nuclear attack, get under cover or a protective barrier. Cover your head, neck, and face. Don protective clothing and equipment as able. Get to shelter immediately after the blast and thermal radiation have subsided. Seek medical treatment as quickly as possible. Further evacuate as able to a safe zone and survive. What are the dangers of a nuclear attack? For a quick reference, the dangers of a nuclear attack are the immediate blast, the typical explosion related damage, the electromagnetic pulse and damage to electronics and radar systems, the thermal radiation, which causes burns in varying degrees of severity based on the different distances from and intensity of the blast, the ionizing radiation that immediately affects and contaminates people with radiation poisoning and the surrounding area, and the residual radiation that lingers long after the blast. Ionizing and residual radiation are also the core elements of fallout. Blasts are determined by the size and weight of the weapon called a yield, kiloton or megaton scale. One kiloton is 1,000 tons of TNT in equivalence. One megaton is 1 million tons of TNT. One kiloton bombs, small, have about a seventh of a kilometer, 0.7 kilometer or one and a half kilometer squared area of effect immediate effect with blast and radi uh, thermal radiation. 20 kilotons, which is small getting into the medium size, has about a 1.8 or a 10 kilometer square area of effect with the immediate blast. One megaton bomb, which is large, 7 to 13 kilometers or 150 to 600 kilometers square area of immediate effect. Most conventional weapons are between 200 and 440 kilotons, but can very wildly uh, from much less to much more than average that. There's also the radioactive fallout. From direct skin to contact with fallout particles in the air, external, from fallout particles that fell on the ground and that later come into contact with the skin, also external, or from eating plants, milk, or meat that had radioactive fallout on it or in it, which is an internal, uh, from breathing in radioactive material in the air, which is internally, Exposure to high levels of ionizing and residual radiation fallout will cause extreme radiation poisoning that can result in death, and we've seen this from Chernobyl and other examples. Radioactive iodine, called I-131, was the most important isotope in fallout. 
iodine-131, called I-131, which exposes thyroid gland for about two months after each nuclear test or exposure, is the most important harmful radioactive material isotope in global fallout. People exposed to I-131, especially during childhood, may have an increased risk of thyroid disease, including thyroid cancer many years later. Other radioactive materials in fallout, such as strontium-90, can affect a person's bone marrow and lead to an increased risk of leukemia. Some of these isotopes could affect people through external exposure, uh, exposure to radiation outside the body, as mentioned before, while some could affect people through internal exposure, such as ingestion, breathing it in, things like that, uh, targeting specific organs uh, with radiation inside the body. Some radioactive materials remain for only a short time, while others remain for a long period, and that plays into the term called half-life. Because some of the isotopes in fallout uh, from use and testing of prior weapons are the long-lasting type, a small amount of radioactive fallout remains in the environment even today all over the world, and people can, can continue to be exposed. Again, Chernobyl is a prime example, Fukushima power plant, Hiroshima, Nagasaki in Japan still have the effects of the half-life of radioactive material. There's also the after effects on society from a nuclear event, including mass casualties and the psychological trauma, economy and collapse or inability to acquire basic goods, and a country's uh, function overall. Foreign military invasion is another added factor to, in this ultimate danger should an event like this happen. The next section is uh, political climate and imminent nature of an attack. First thing is understanding the geopolitical sphere and ident identifying the veritable threats. Obviously with current conflicts and other foreign aggressions aimed at interrupting economics and na national safety and sovereignty on a global scale, this is obviously important. The primary identifiable nuclear capable threats to the USA currently are China with approximately 350 nuclear warheads, Russia with approximately 6,257 warheads, North Korea with approximately 45 warheads, Iran with an unknown number of nuclear capable weapons, they are currently enriching uranium and developing warheads, and of course terrorism and global scale religious extremist groups with an unknown number of seaburn chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear capable weapons of mass destruction, which they do have in their possession. Early warning and alert systems and video or radio based alerts are extremely important to pay attention to and stay constantly updated on. If one of these alerts broadcasts, do not panic. I say again, do not panic. Implement your plans, grab your gear and supplies, and get to the location or locations you have picked for safety and potential long term sheltering. The next section is preparation and your provisions and equipment. There are some long-standing factors that are 100% applicable in your preparation and survival during a nuclear attack. These recommendations should always be weighed with what's practical and accessible to you individually. First, you have to prepare. You have to determine the logistics of your evacuation, plan your routes of travel, factor the population influence on your ability to relocate, Determine how much of your provisions and fuel, if applicable, you can bring additionally, and your overall emergency response plan with your family, friends, and network. Staying in a major, staying in a major metropolitan area or city and near vital infrastructure such as power plants, pipelines, military installations, or bases is not recommended unless you have plentiful provisions and a proper high-level protective shelter avail available. But even then, you will likely have to evacuate should your area take a direct hit or as provisions dwindle and are, a and are unable to resupply. For your shelter, determine the stock of your provisions, factor the air quality and safety measures for your shelter, determine your ability to sustain and maintain and thrive in your shelter for an extended period of time, how to protect your shelter further, and, ha and have your secondary plan for evacuation as necessary. Any man-made emergency fallout shelter needs to be a minimum of 18 inches underground for the best insulated protection. In the event of a foreign-based attack from military or par paramilitary forces 
or other kind of hazardous or seaburn attack, additional precautions and actions need to be taken, such as, in addition to reinforcing your windows and doors in the event of a nuclear attack or a seaburn related attack, you need to insulate and seal your home. This means getting good plastic sheeting, much like the winterizing material found in colder climates in the northern United States, that you can use to seal all entry points and windows, as well as any ducting outlets that feed to outside, such as dryer vents and bathroom air vents or ducts. This is only a temporary solution to a problem that may last for a short amount of time, but could last much longer with regards to fallout and the half-life factor of seaburn-related agents. It is meant to be a protective buffer until the coast is clear or you can safely evacuate to a clean zone, an area unaffected by such aspects. With these tools and actions, you do need to be careful, so ensure you have a carbon monoxide detector on every floor of your home. Additionally, having adequate water filtration and purification is extremely important even for underground aquifer, uh, aquifer sources or drawn wells. Secondly, your equipment to have uh, stored in your safety shelter or for quick access in your evacuation are emergency food and water, obviously. Ideally, shelf-stable, long-lasting meals and canned goods that can sustain you for an extended amount of time with little waste or preparation to include freeze-dried hiking or camping meals, emergency MRE, meal ready to eat, military or emergency meals, long-life pouches of food, and canned foods in variety to include fruits, vegetables, fish and meats, broth or stock, and other soups or dishes. <clears throat> Rice is also easy to obtain a large quantity of, and when stored properly will last a long time. Water should be stored in protective sealing, sealing containers and aerated or circulated regularly when in long-term needs and use. You should have no less than a month's worth of food, and that's two meals a day minimum, and water, approximately one to three gallons a day usage, stored in your shelter. <clears throat> Next is extra clothing and protective equipment. Layers and extra clothes are essential for several reasons, like hygiene, warmth, and emergency layers in the event of having to be mobile and escape the event. Protective layers are a must. Also with protective layers, a good thick poncho or tarp, rubberized boots and gloves, multiple layers of uh, nitrile gloves also works and helps and even a full safety suit called a mop or seaburn s suit specifically designed for protection and mitigation from nuclear fallout it is highly recommended you also obtain a filter system respirator or gas mask with seaburn rated replaceable filters <clears throat> next is medications with this proper medication or counter agent substances like specific iodine or iodide for protection against radiation to protect your thyroid and needed prescriptions along with antibiotics and general medical supplies such as bandages should be stocked to a level for use for 15 to 30 days in conjunction with an event or exposure and medical treatment will, necess uh, will be necessary should exposure happen. Hygiene implementations. Water also factors for use here, but you should also have plentiful soap and toothpaste along with clean towels. Unless, de unless decontamination is needed, you should bathe every other day or every two days. Additionally, activated charcoal is useful for cleaning yourself and any needs for, de for decontamination. Also with hygiene, you have to maintain your shelter and mitigate risks with vermin such as cockroaches, rats, and mice to aid in preventing illnesses and disease while you're there for an extended period of time. The topic of self-defense weaponry is, often is an often discussed factor. Should you choose to have firearms in your shelter or during your evacuation, just ensure it is a reliable system you're familiar with and carry an appropriate amount of ammunition an average rifle combat load is 320 to 550 rounds with 60 to 220 rounds for a pistol, backup pistol, unless it's your primary carbine system, then refer to the rifle loadout, and accompanying components, magazines, spare parts, lubricant, etc. The next section is protection and evacuation considerations and actions. 
with the factors regarding the blast or attack itself, you need to understand the region you're in. Terrain features, airstream, wind direction, and accessible clean water are going to be extremely important for your survival should you either decide to stay in shelter or evacuate. Natural rock features, especially mountain ranges, are excellent buffers in between you and a blast and its effects, but you need to be aware of earthquakes and rock slides. Caves and mines are great natural emergency survival shelters. The deeper you can get underground into a mountain, the better, while considering the mitigating risks of a collapse within that structure. If you're evacuating, move away from the affected area against the wind. Radiation particles travel on the airstream. Typically in the USA, the wind flows to the east, so head west. Understand how the airstreams move in your region along with what is accessible clean water once you get to a safer or unaffected areas. Implement all of your plans and logistics with evacuation and utilize your protective equipment. You need to move as quickly but safely as possible a minimum of 70 miles. Depending on the yield or power of the blast, it could be much further if survivable. It is recommended somewhere between 75 and 200 miles away from the affected area. If sheltering in place, again, you need to understand that you may be stuck in that location for an extended period of time. The average response time for rescue and emergency services to safely enter a zone, a, a zone of effect is three days and could be much longer. Determining when it is safe enough to leave your shelter without assistance is difficult, so do not be hasty in your attempts to get outside and un unnecessarily expose yourself to radiation. Try to establish communication first with any assistance before venturing out on your own unless absolutely necessary, in which case you need to utilize all safety and protective equipment, including medication. If you are exposed to a nuclear attack and its subsequent radiation, seek medical attention immediately. You may have to travel to an unaffected facility for assistance or otherwise, but your life depends on getting to medical help as quickly as possible. In summary, you need to know the threats and dangers. You need to have a plan for shelter and evacuation. You need to have preparation of your needs, goods, and equipment. You need to listen to emergency alerts. Do not panic. Do not panic. Once the event happens, take action. Get to shelter or evacuate. And then seek medical attention immediately if exposed or injured by a nuclear attack. Provided below are some links and provided additionally are going to be several other PDFs for additional information in depth coming from uh, civil affairs divisions uh, over a span of time and from different state entities.